Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. At this time, please turn off all electronic devices. Please refrain from using flash photography during the program. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Ben Shapiro. <laughs> wow. Well, good evening, everyone. A few of you know me. My name's John Highbush. I have the honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. Thank you all for coming out this evening. Now, in honor of our men and women in uniform who protect our freedoms around the world, would you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks. Please be seated. Before we get started, there are a few people in the audience I'd like to make sure we recognize, and I'll start with Ben Shapiro's parents, David and Cindy Shapiro, and his wife, Moore. Thank you. And of course, former Congressman Elton Gallagher and his wife, Janice Elton. So, a few years ago, when I used to drop my kids off at school on the way to work at the Reagan Library, we would enjoy about 20 minutes together during the car ride along the way. Maybe enjoy is not the right verb, but like any red-blooded American family, we would fight like cats on a daily basis over what to listen to on the radio as they scrambled to finish their homework at the last minute. Don't worry, Ben, it might not sound like it, but your introduction, like their school, is just around the corner. Okay? <laughs> As I was saying, the ride was a titanic struggle. My fourth grader would insist on this CD of Broadway musicals. She's an aspiring actress. My, my son, soon to join the ranks of middle school, wanted alternative rock. Fortunately, I had total command over what we actually listened to because I was the only adult in the car, although my wife would argue with that. <laughs> but because my kids were proverbial prisoners in the back seat, seat belted about a mile away from the buttons, I really was in charge. Me, I demanded we spend most of our morning time listening to a station called AM870. Many of you might know it. When I first discovered it by accident, I found it featured, in part, a fresh, new, remarkably bright, and deeply thoughtful conservative voice I had not heard before. His name was Ben Shapiro. I told you I would get to this. <laughs> About a week after discovering him, I quickly determined the show's format was not right for him. He is bigger than this, I thought. In between the morning program's jokes and impressions and listener call-ins and advertisements, every once in a while, the other two talented hosts would let Ben get a word in edgewise. And when he spoke, it blew me away. I found not just any conservative voice. These were not warmed over talking points from some think tank or a pundit you know, that had been loose in the social blogosphere the day before. This was an extremely articulate point of view from a new, younger generation who had something valuable to, or provocative to say every time he opened his mouth. Now, like it or not, the child hostages I had in my back seat were going to listen to him and listen good. 
I wanted him to get a full dose of his keen mind, his logic, his ability to articulate the conservative cause on a lot of issues in a way that few others I had heard about before. So after two weeks of these ride sessions, even my once distracted kids would go silent in attention, listening to what Ben had to say. He was that good. When the program would cut to commercial break, the three of us would continue the conversation or the debate that Ben had started, and I could see their minds at work. Exactly the right way to start the day. School was in session before school was in session. Then came January 13th, 2017 a day that will live in infamy. We were listening to the program. What does Ben mean he's signing off? My daughter said. What's that mean? She looked at me confused. We're screwed is what it means, her brother said. <laughs> Ben's leaving the show. The next week, after the depression had set in, our rides to the school were silent. No Broadway tunes on a CD, no alternative rock. They were having none of it. I thought it was the end of our morning education together. That is, until the following week, my son tapped me on the shoulder from the back seat. Guess what, Dad, he said. I saw him as hug his sister for the first time this century. <laughs> then he held forth his phone. Ben Shapiro's got a podcast. <laughs> well, boy, does he ever. The top conservative podcast in the nation. Eight books and counting. One, a New York Times bestseller, and the one he's got out just today, I'm sure, will be on the list as well. Major newspaper columns are appearing across the nation. Numerous appearances on Fox News, including his recent four-part election, election series, which was just terrific. Hundreds of other radio and TV show interviews, dozens of appearances, sometimes attempted appearances at colleges and universities, <laughs> talking about the oft-times violent and taboo topic of, yeah, free speech. And of course, his role as editor-in-chief of the Daily Wire. We are honored to have Ben Shapiro with us, and believe me, Ben, my kids, while in the middle of their homework right now, are watching you live on web TV. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Reagan Library, Mr. Ben Shapiro. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the Reagan Library, which is obviously an unbelievably inspiring place to launch my new book and just an inspiring place to be generally the greatest president of my lifetime, although I was four years old when he left. It is amazing to be here. John was generous enough to be pushing for an event here for, for a long time, and it's fantastic to be at the home of Ronald Reagan, the president who reminded us that tyranny is no more than one generation away if we don't stand up for the truth and if we do not stand up for that which is righteous and, and free. I also want to thank my parents for showing up, as I say in the dedication to my new book. You know, my, my life is pretty, is pretty blessed. I, I really do have an incredibly blessed life. Uh, it's particularly true in my family life. And I go home, people say, what do you do for fun? And my answer is I hang out with my family. Uh, and as I say in the dedication at the beginning of the book, uh, the, you know, my parents taught me that life has a reason. My wife, who is here and is a doctor, taught me <laughs> that life has a meaning. And my children, who are currently being cared for by an unlucky soul, <laughs> taught me that life has a purpose. Now, tonight, I get to talk about my new book, The Right Side of History. Now, obviously, I think that phrase can be used in extraordinarily pernicious ways. I've tweeted about this before. I think the President Obama, for example, used to say the right side of history. You'll be on the wrong side of history if you don't agree with President Obama. But of course, that's not how I mean the right side of history. What I mean is that we live in the greatest, freest, most prosperous country in the history of the world. That America is on the right side of history because history has already made its judgment on America's founding ideals and found it to be up to snuff. 
Now, I want to talk a little bit about Western civilization, because the truth is that the reason I believe that America is so great is because it is the apex, it is the apotheosis of a 3,000-year history of intellectual development, of fundamental principles. What makes America exceptional is not that we have an incredible country filled with beautiful land and natural resources. What makes it special is not even the people who live here. It's that the people who live here have grown up in a society replete with values, which is why America can always grow, which is why people can come in and become American. It's why my great-grandparents could come here knowing no English and with no money and become American, because America was and is an idea, something that President Reagan understood well. America is the peak of what Western civilization was built to be. And while we have not always lived up to the promise of the founding principles, those founding principles were good, true, and eternal. And they were based in a deeper good, true, and eternal truth that springs from Sinai, moves forward through the Sermon on the Mount, through Greek teleology, and down to us today. If we enjoy everything from the iPhones in our pocket to the free speech we get to benefit from in the United States, that's because we are beneficiaries of this system, because we stand atop a building that we did not build. It seems these days that a lot of folks in America, particularly people my age and younger, which increasingly is, is everyone. I'm growing older and it scares me. But as, as we see, there are a lot of folks who are willing to overthrow these fundamental principles in favor of radical new solutions. And their premise is that America is a very bad place. You saw Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez say this just the other day. She was speaking at South by Southwest, and she suggested that America was essentially horrible, and that the only way to fix America was to imbibe from her socialist brew. That was the only way to fix the United States. Now, Western civilization is fundamentally flawed. And what we have right now in the West is a conflict of meaning. We have a group of folks who believe that Western civilization was built on great principles and a group of people who believe that Western civilization is essentially a power hierarchy. That it's basically just a bunch of people who are very powerful, who created principles so that they could cram down that power on other people. That when you boil down the West to its bare essence, what it really is is white supremacy. I know that we all watched and were shocked by and horrified and mourned the situation in New Zealand. The evil white supremacist shooter in New Zealand wrote this manifesto, which I've encouraged no one to read because it's, a, it's garbage and we should not give it any more play than it already has been given in the media. But one of the things that the media have been pointing out is that this piece of human debris used the term the West a lot. In fact, there was an article in the Washington Post at the beginning of this year talking about how Western civilization really meant white supremacy. And this white supremacist believed the same thing. This white supremacist said that Western civilization was about the racial superiority of white folks. He suggested that the myth of the individual was something terrible. He talked about how much he hated the sovereignty of private property, how much he hated capitalism. He tore into conservatism as inherently bad because it hadn't conserved anything, namely the white majority. If you boil down Western civilization to the color of people's skin, you're doing it wrong. And yet you see the same thing from folks on the left, on the intersectional left. They suggest that when we say Western civilization, what we mean is white people. When we say Western civilization, we mean we want to reinforce power hierarchies that have ground people down under the boot of white people, of European people. That is not what Western civilization was about. If it were, I wouldn't be standing here wearing a yarmulke extolling its greatness. Western civilization is the system that brought us science. It is the system that brought us free markets. It is the system that brought us prosperity. It is the, it is the system that brought us liberalism. It is the system that brought us democracy. I mean, how dominant is the West? The West is so dominant that the evil tyranny of North Korea feels the necessity to call itself a republic. Because everyone understands that a republic is the proper form of government. That's how dominant Western civilization is. And on a material level, of course, Western civilization is absolutely phenomenal. The average person in 1850s Europe died before the age of 40. Now the average person in Western civilization dies upwards of the age of 80. Western civilization has raised 80% of people from extreme poverty on the planet since 1980. Western civilization has meant that in 1900, in America, one in 10 babies died before the age of one. Western civilization means that if a baby is born in the United States, you can expect that baby to live to the age of 80 or later. That's what Western civilization has done. And yet, living in the most prosperous society, in the freest society, the most equal society in the history of mankind, people are really, really angry. 
And you can see people are really angry. And so I got to thinking about why people are angry. That's where this book came from. Why are people so angry at each other, given the fact that we've been given all these gifts and we stand atop the Empire State Building of Western civilization, and we seem to believe that for some reason we're floating in midair? So what exactly went wrong? Why aren't we happy? Well, I think that we have to look back to our foundations. If we want to truly understand Western civilization, we have to look all the way back. You know, this is the part where conservatism matters, because conservatism is about conserving. It's about going back and looking at those roots and understanding why the roots are there. Chesterton famously suggested that the difference between people on the left and people on the right is that if you were on the left and you were walking in a field and you came across a fence and you didn't know why the fence was there, if you were on the left, you would simply say, I don't know why this fence is here, and then you would remove the fence. And if you were on the right, if you were conservative, you would say, I don't know why the fence is here, but I'm going to learn why the fence is here, and then maybe we'll consider whether we can remove the fence. Before we throw Western civilization out, it seems like we might want to re-examine the premises of Western civilization. Because Western civilization has created the greatest system for human happiness in human history. But not the kind of happiness that's being preached on college campuses. Not the kind of happiness that is about whatever floats your boat, and libertinism, and whatever, you, whatever makes you happy, your subjective perception of the good. That's not what happiness is about. Western civilization had its own its own definition of what happiness was. When Thomas Jefferson talks in the Declaration of Independence about, about the pursuit of happiness, he didn't mean your ability to watch Netflix and chill. And Thomas Jefferson was talking about something with a very specific meaning. What Thomas Jefferson was talking about was the same thing that the Bible talks about and that Aristotle was talking about. In the biblical language, the word for happiness is simcha. And you are commanded to be besimcha. You are commanded to be happy. Well, how can you be commanded to feel an emotion? How can you be commanded to be happy? It's because for the biblical living people who populated Western civilization, simcha, happiness, lay in right action in accordance with God's will. That's what happiness was. And that didn't mean you were emotionally happy about this stuff. It meant you did your duty, and this gave you a life of happiness and meaning. It lay, it, meaning lay, happiness lay in moral purpose. That's where meaning lay. That's where purpose lay. Aristotle believed the same thing. He called it eudaimonia. And the idea was that if you are active in accord with complete virtue, then you would be happy, right? Purpose is where you find your happiness. So what exactly, as members of the West, did we need, as human beings, did we need to achieve this kind of happiness? We need four different things. We need individual moral purpose. We need individual capacity. We need communal moral purpose. And we need communal capacity. Individual moral purpose is the idea that we are all made in God's image, that we are endowed with both rights and duties. That if we were on a desert island, we would have an obligation to act in the right way. Our moral purpose lies in our relationship with God in the religious worldview and in our relationship with reason in the Greek worldview. That if you acted in accord with right reason, this would give you purpose. That was the Greek idea. And if you acted in accord with God's will, this is what gave you purpose in the Judeo-Christian worldview that undergirds Western civilization. We have to have meaning as individuals. And freedom is the flip side of that. We have to have freedom to worship. We have to have freedom to pursue reason. We have to have freedom to debate and argue and discuss. Right? This is the birth of individual rights. You have to have individual purpose. Individual capacity is the idea that we have to see ourselves not as victims. We have to see ourselves as free actors with will and the capacity for reason. That we are not simply corks bobbing about on the eddies of, of whatever civilization we live in. That we are free, powerful actors. Now, you see a lot of people fighting that perception today, believing that victimization and talking about how victimized you are is somehow empowerment. It is precisely the opposite. No one finds happiness in being a victim. You actually have to believe in your own capacity to change the world. Viktor Frankl talks about the, the philosopher and psychologist who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, who lived through the death camps of, of Auschwitz. He talked about the Holocaust, and he said this, every day, every hour offered the opportunity to make a decision a decision which determined whether you would or would not submit to those powers which threatened to rob you of your very self, your inner freedom, which determined whether or not you would become the plaything of circumstance, renouncing freedom and dignity to become molded into the form of the typical inmate. In other words, you could even find meaning and purpose in a place like Auschwitz. How much more so should we be able to find meaning and purpose in the freest land in the history of humanity? We also need communal moral purpose. We have to believe that we as a community stand for something, fundamental principles. And that means we also need a social fabric. 
We need to believe that we are all brothers in a fight. Now, Robert Putnam, who's a liberal sociologist from Harvard, he talked about diversity, and he was a big believer that diversity is our strength. What he found, and this is a, an almost direct quote from, from Putnam, is that as the diversity of a census tract goes up, only two things go up predictably, TV watching and protest marches. Those are the only two things. But he said, diversity is a good thing if you have a common purpose. So when you go to a church, when you go to a synagogue, you look across the crowd and you see a bunch of people with diverse experiences and backgrounds and races, and they're all worshiping together. Then you have a rich, meaningful community. The same thing is true in the military. When you talk to folks who have served in the military and thank you to everyone who has made a sacrifice that I never did to defend a civilization worth protecting. When you talk to folks in the military, what they will tell you is that they're friends with people of every race, every color, every background, because they all have a common purpose. They're all fighting for something. We have to have a communal moral purpose, something toward which we are directed. And finally, we have to have communal capacity. And this is what America really got right. We have to have a system that, that understands that you can only preserve individual purpose and individual capacity and communal purpose if we get together on a voluntary basis, not forced from the top down. We have to have the ability to mobilize in times of crisis to fend off the terrors of the night. But at the same time, we have to understand that our community is built on a social fabric and that without a moral and religious people, government ain't going to cut it. So what built this society? What built this society was effectively two poles. And the story of Western civilization, not just America, Western civilization is about the tension between these two poles. Think of civilization as a suspension bridge. And on one pole, you have Jerusalem. And on the other pole, you have Athens. On this side, you have the idea of Judeo-Christian values, revelation by God of certain fundamental values. And on the other side, we have Greek reason, the idea that we have to apply our reason to the world around us and get to know that world and investigate that world and base our views on evidence. These two have been in conflict. They've fought. Sometimes religion takes precedence. Sometimes reason takes precedence. But when you get rid of either, the civilization utterly collapses as I'll discuss in just a second. So what did we learn from the Judeo-Christian value system? And this is not an argument that you have to believe in God to be a good person. It's not. You can be a perfectly good person not believing in God. You can act morally. You can be a decent human being. You can take the same actions as a person who's religious. There are many religious people I know who are worse people than secular atheists that I know. Okay, but that is not an argument that you can base a civilization on atheistic foundations. You cannot. You cannot base a civilization on the idea that there is no order in the universe. I'll explain. Judeo-Christianity teaches several fundamental values. And you can make these assumptions as a secular humanist. You can make these assumptions and just say it didn't come from God. Fine, assume away, but don't pretend they're evidence-based. They are not. You have to make the assumption or you have to believe these came from God. One, that God is unified and a master plan stands behind everything. You live in a predictable, understandable universe. And your mind reflects the Almighty's to the extent that you can search out meaning in that universe. That you can look at the universe and learn things about God and that God acts in moral ways, in predictable ways. You know, Judaism was a fundamental sea shift in how people saw the nature of the universe itself. Paganism basically says that you are at the whim of fate, you are at the whim of a chaotic universe, and that therefore you're not in control of your own life. Judeo-Christianity suggested something different. It said that God is moral, God created a moral world for you. That doesn't mean you always understand his morality, but there is an order to the universe. If there's an order to the universe, that means that you can act with confidence in that universe. In Judaism, you can even go so far as to challenge God on his own moral precepts. This is what Abraham does to God when God is about to destroy Sodom. Abraham says, are you sure you want to do that? And you see Moses doing this repeatedly with God. The notion of arguing God's morality with God is a uniquely Judeo-Christian concept. Because there are standards. It's an orderly universe. God has a logic to him. Second, Judeo-Christian values teach us that human beings are held to morality because morality does not come from us. We don't get to create our own moral systems. You don't get to just randomly decide what is moral and what is not on a given day. Instead, there are certain fundamental bases for morality that come from something higher than you. And therefore, morality is not just a matter of pragmatism. It's not just a matter of the strong eating the weak. It is not just a matter of doing whatever is in your interest today. It's something different. It's something higher. And you're to be held to that standard. This is how we can adjudicate whether people are acting well or acting badly. Good example of this. In the pagan world, sacrifices were made to appease the gods. You made a sacrifice just to buy off the gods. You give them a piece of meat, God's happy, he'll give you rain, everything's great. In the Judeo-Christian system, sacrifices of any sort are made to be a moral reminder. The idea is that this 
should be me, right? I'm sacrificing something of myself to remind me that I am not supreme in this particular scenario. Okay, another lesson from Judeo-Christian system, history progresses. So if you look at a lot of pagan systems, they believe that history is circular or that history is eternal. It doesn't change. It sort of rises and falls, it ebbs and flows. Judeo-Christianity said that God is active in history and history does have a progressive narrative. Not a politically progressive narrative. It has a progressive narrative toward things getting better if we act properly. The Bible sets God in the context of a time-bound history. And finally, the Bible suggests that we have free choice. It's something you can't get to with atheist materialism. If you believe you're a wandering ball of meat with no capacity to choose, free choice is not on the table. But the Bible suggests that it absolutely is. You are responsible for your own decisions. And this is established right at the get-go. When it says in the Bible that you are made in God's image, that's because God has creative free capacity. The story of Cain and Abel is entirely about your ability to choose. It's entirely about the fact that when Cain does not please God, God's response to Cain is, Tim Shell, you actually have to go out and do better, right? You can fix this. You can fix this. That's a unique concept in world history, and it's the spark that lights the idea of freedom. So that's what we learn from Judeo-Christian values on a very basic level. What do we learn from Greek reason? On the other hand, what do we, where does reason come in? Well, the answer is that if you have just a Judeo-Christian system handed down by God, reason doesn't come into it, presumably, because you just obey whatever God tells you, and then you have a theocracy. You're not going to get to freedom, necessarily, just from Judeo-Christianity. You need reason applied to the biblical text and to biblical living in order to get to this apotheosis, in order to get to the synthesis that characterizes Western civilization. This is where Greece comes in. So Greece suggests, Greek thought, the, the philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, they believe that there was a purpose in nature, that simply by looking at the things around you, you could determine that these things were directed toward something. So what makes something good in the Aristotelian belief system is not something that is morally good or something that is morally bad. It's fulfilling the purpose of that thing. So for example, a good spoon is a spoon that is capable of carrying soup. Why? Because it does what it is supposed to. And a good horse is a horse that is capable of carrying a human being. And a good person is a person who uses their reason. What makes you human is your use of reason, not your tribal identity, not your subjective feelings. What makes you human and important is your use of reason. And if we apply that reason to the universe, then we can learn lessons about other people and we can learn lessons about the world. And in fact, that's our obligation. Living as a moral human being means using your reason. There are not going to be different laws for for different people outside of reason. It's not just arbitrariness. Instead, it is the idea that because we are reasonable people, we can have reasonable conversations. This is the birth of democracy. On the one hand, the idea you are made in God's image. On the other hand, that you have reason and you can speak with somebody who has different experiences than you. So my entire book is about this tension between Jerusalem and Athens and how the push and pull, that tension created the West and culminated in the United States. If you read the Declaration of Independence, everything that I am saying is deeply embedded in the words of the Declaration of Independence. The notion of all human beings having equal rights and independence sprang originally from that biblical Judeo-Christian notion of man being made in God's image, admixed with the Greek tradition of individual reason, passed down generation after generation, transmuted over time into the understanding that not only are human beings made in God's image with will and reason, but we have a right, we have a natural right, we have a liberty to exercise that reason, because otherwise we can't fulfill what God wants of us. The founders, despite the common misperception that they were a bunch of atheist de de deists, they, they knew all of this stuff. Washington famously said, the foundation of our national policy will be laid in the pure and immutable principles of private morality. There exists in the economy and course of nature an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness. Right? This is the, America is the place where all of this came together. Those are the principles in the Declaration of Independence. Those are the principles in the Constitution. Have we been perfect in our application of those principles? Of course not. But the goal of America is to live up to those principles, not to discard those principles. And here's where we get into the difficulties with today. Because on the one hand, there are a lot of folks who have decided they want to discard Jerusalem. And on the other, you have a bunch of folks who have decided they want to discard Athens. A bunch of folks who believe that religion is bad, religion is terrible, religion is repressive, religion is tyrannical. We have to force religious people to violate their own precepts and their business practices. If, people, if kids are taught religion, then they are being perverted against the common good. But here's the truth. Without religion, there is no free will and there is no reason. You cannot make the argument that human beings are capable of making freely willed decisions 
in a universe where human beings are a bunch of, are a set of firing neurons and a ball of meat wandering through the universe. Being a secular materialist does not give you freedom. It chains you to your biology. There is no way to be free without Jerusalem. Okay, there's no purpose because we can try to create our own purposes, and that's what we've been doing ever since Nietzsche declared the death of God. Human beings have been trying to declare their own purpose. We used to find our purpose in fulfilling God's design for us, interpreted through biblical text and tradition, interpreted through reason. Instead, we decided that we were going to create our own purposes. And that's gotten very, very ugly over the past century and a half. It's been filled with romantic nationalism, the idea that if we can't find a purpose in living individually and communally in accordance with God's will or in accordance with with a, tele, a telos, a purpose that we can discern in nature, that we are going to fill all of this, we are going to fill our need for meaning with binding each other tribally. We're tribes and we fight each other. And we're seeing that today in the intersectional movement or in the white supremacist movement. Historically, we saw this in Nazi Germany. The idea that we are going to find meaning in just the will of a nation. That we are going to find meaning in simple nationalism itself without any reference to deeper principles. We find this in communism, where we say that we'll find meaning in the collective. Individuals disappear, I find my meaning in the collective, thus I will be happy. The true draw of socialism is not economic, obviously, because capitalism creates gains and socialism at best redistributes them before destroying the gains. Communism makes a different promise. It promises that you will be spiritually transformed if you hand over your life to the, com to the commune. If you hand over your life to the community, you no longer exist as an individual and there's something freeing in that. That's the promise of communism. All it did was cost about 100 million lives in the 20th century. Because if people don't, aren't willing to give up their lives to the commune, well, then you just break a few eggs and you make an omelet. And finally, in the West, it's broken down into subjectivism. The idea that we can fulfill our longings, that longing for something higher, that longing for meaning and purpose, we can fill that by reference to our own feelings, with reference to self-esteem. And if we are microaggressed, or if we are triggered, then we have been insulted. And that is the same as violence. If someone says something that I don't like, that's an attack on my identity, and it must be shut down. And if that means overriding free speech, if that means overriding freedom, well then hell, I'll just do it. Because after all, my happiness relies on my subjective perception of my own value. Not achievement, not any sort of discernible purpose, simply how I feel today. That's where you get without religion. And without reason, you get to the theocracy. Without reason, you end up with theocracy, which was most of the history of the West up until about 1750. It's very easy to fall into that. If you want to see what theocracy looks like, all you have to do is look to the radical Islamic world. That is not a pretty picture. That's what happens when you, when you separate off religion and reason instead of allowing them to be wed as they should be. And the reason that I feel like we need to talk about all of this stuff, you know, this is abstruse, it's difficult, it's not easy. The reason that I feel like we need to talk about all this stuff is because we gloss over what makes America great, what makes Western civilization great, with easy slogans about freedom and liberty, and all of that's wonderful, except that people don't hold it in common meaning. If you talk to folks on the left, they don't believe the same thing about liberty that you believe. They believe that liberty means they should be able to take your property and redistribute it. If you talk to folks on the left about equality, they don't believe in equality of rights, they believe in equality of outcome. If you talk to folks on the left about civilization being great because of our prosperity, the first thing they do is say, well, we are unequal in outcome, and thus our prosperity is no good. It would be better if we were impoverished but equal. We don't have the same priorities anymore. If we want to return to those priorities, we have to understand the fundamental truths about human nature, that we are made in God's image, that we are, that we are angels and bodies, that we have a soul, and that that soul means something, and that we have a unique capacity to speak with one another, and that our rights spring from that capacity, that we have individual purpose given by God and reason, that we have individual capacity given by God to reason. We have communal purpose handed down from Sinai, and discoverable in nature under natural law, and that we have communal capacity to do something about it, to protect the civilization that was given us. Because if we don't protect those foundations, the entire edifice is going to crumble. We have to teach this stuff to our kids. That's what I intend on teaching my kids. That's why I wrote the book. I know that it's a difficult book, and I'm, I'm really gratified that so many people bought it. I know it's the number one political and history book on planet Earth as of the moment. It was ranked number three on Amazon overall after a health book about how to prevent cancer. Let's re-engage with the ideas that animated our civilization in the first place. If we do, we will save that civilization and preserve it for the future. Civilization, as Ronald Reagan said, is always one generation away from extinction. It is also one generation away from restoration. Thank you so much. Happy to take questions.
uh, it's a big room, so uh, we have staff in the aisles with microphones. If you have a question, you might raise your hand, and we'd be happy to uh, have you go. We'll start right here. Uh, just uh, because you were banned from Berkeley and mm -hmm. other colleges, is, do you see any way that we can recapture the education system? Because it is so ingrained by the left. I mean, I, I despair, obviously, of large swaths of the education system. I'm proud to be associated personally with Hillsdale College. Uh, they sponsor my program, but I'm a big Hillsdale fan. <laughs> Have been for a long time. I know Liberty University also does some great work. There are some, some really good colleges out there that are still trying to teach fundamental values, but here's my belief. My belief is that values are generally not inculcated by the school. They're inculcated by the parents, and then the parents pick the school. Uh, and so what that means is not that we should give up on the public education system. It means that we should seek to take back the public education system, but the education starts in the home, obviously. I mean, on a practical policy level, it means breaking the teachers' unions, frankly. Uh, the public teachers' unions are a, a massive detriment to kids all over the country. I'm talking about starting at a very young age. If you want to inculcate civilization, civilization doesn't just arrive in, in your mother's milk, right? I mean, it actually is something that has to be taught and felt and experienced. You know, the social capital that comes with civilization comes from the time you're a young kid. That's why people are friends with people with whom they were children very often. Uh, so, you know, I, I worry about the college campuses too, but I think that the college campuses are the final, uh, the, the, they're the repository of a lot of bad ideas and the, and, the, and the wellspring of a lot of terrible, terrible ideas. But if we actually want to take back the next generation, we're going to have to start not at the college level, we're going to have to start at the elementary school level, we're going to have to go back to church, we're going to have to go back to synagogue, we're going to have to work with each other on restoring some semblance of values. Hello, Mr. Shapiro. I'm a huge fan. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you actually um, made me a conservative, so thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you. So I guess with that being said, the one question I have for you is, when can we expect you to run for the presidency? <laughs> Well, not this time. <laughs> That's all I'll say on the matter. <laughs> uh, right over here. Thank you, Ben, for sharing your time and your brilliance with us. We re very much appreciate it. Um, I had a curious question about you talking about the Greeks, and I'm a big fan of the classics. And it brings me to the question, is there a strategic inoculation of the classics, perhaps in our education system, where I'm curious to know what your take is with the just complete, you don't see the study of the classics and the Greeks and um, all yeah. the, Hel the, Hel the Hellenic period uh, in world history. So I'd like to take your take. I mean, I think that's certainly true. It's, it's sort of it's sort of subsumed into broader world history courses that you see. It's not taught as something special. It used to be the Western civilization courses were essentially required at most major universities. That is no longer the case. Uh, that's because in the 1980s, members of the left, including people like Jesse Jackson, I mean, Jesse Jackson literally went around the campus at Berkeley shouting, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. And the reason that he was doing that is because there is this view on the left and in, in critical studies majors, that essentially Western civilization is that power hierarchy I was discussing at the beginning, and the only way to make a better world is to rip out that power hi hierarchy at the roots, criticize it as racist, sexist, bigoted, homophobic. You know, when I talk about Western civilization and its glories, the left always responds with, well, yes, and there was slavery, and there was Jim Crow, and there was homophobia, and all of that is true. It is also true that that stuff has been present in literally every civilization since the beginning of time. The question is, why is our civilization different? Not why is it similar to other civilizations, what made it different? Why is it that we actually treat people and seek to treat people equally without regard to race in the United States where that was not the case for most of human history? Why was it that the United States was instrumental in abolishing slavery? Why was it that Saudi Arabia only abolished slavery officially in 1961 and China in 1919, by the way? Why is it that, they, you know, the fact is that when people look down on Western civilization, they are, they're spitting in the eye of, of what is good. So yes, there is an, an inoculation that goes on. Teaching Western Civ from a value neutral perspective, as though we can't talk about the good and that the bad ought to predominate because we have to be self-critical. It's, it's great to be self-critical, but it's only good to be self-critical self if you're not tearing yourself down. I mean, this is true personally and it's true societally. 
You have to understand that we are a good civilization. Now, let's talk about our flaws and how to rectify them. Not that we are a fundamentally flawed civilization that needs to be destroyed from the inside out and replaced with something far worse. Over here. Hi, Mr. Shapiro. No. Sorry. There we go. Okay, yeah. thank Sorry. you. Um, just a very quick question. I followed uh, your response to Tucker Carlson's piece about economic, uh, that you termed economic populism. I agree with that characterization. Um, virtue comes before prosperity. You mentioned virtue uh, quite a bit here in your book. But my question is, how do we convince people that they have to fix themselves when we have voices you know, on the right and the left telling them they are victims of economic circumstance? Yeah, I'm, I'm very fearful of the rise of populism on both the right and the left. I've, I've been very critical of, of populism. Tucker and I had a long conversation. It's, it's very good. You can watch it on my Sunday special. We had like an hour-long conversation about this. Listen, I like Tucker. Tucker's a brilliant guy. But Tucker is wrong when it comes to his characterization of the American economy. And he is wrong when he talks about his solutions for the American economy. I mean, he, he legitimately said on my Sunday special that he would outlaw self-driving trucks. That is not a solution to the nation's burgeoning economic issues. What is a solution is, is understanding that the economy creates new jobs along with new technologies, which has been true for the entire history of capitalism. Maybe that'll change. If that changes, then we'll have to deal with it. I don't think that we're even close to there yet, considering we're at 3.8% unemployment in this country with 7 million unfilled jobs at this point. As far as the, the notion that you have to inculcate virtue, the reality is that the only people who can decide to change themselves are people, right? I mean, people, people can only decide to change themselves. You can't force somebody to change themselves. You can't force people to engage with virtue. All you can say to them is, your life is going to be miserable if you spend all your time in the freest country in world history discussing why you're a victim. You actually want to change your life? How about you go out and change your life? <laughs> really big concern about the loss of our freedom of speech, uh, just most recently with Judge Janine being taken off TV. But it just seems like it's happening to the conservatives, that we are the ones that are losing our uh, freedom of speech. And so I'm wondering uh, if you feel that there's a way that we can um, combat that as, as conservatives? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, let me just preface this with a, with a statement for Media Matters out there. I didn't like Judge Janine's commentary on El Hano Marci job. Okay, now, as to the, as to the, and I commented on it on my, on my Sunday special, I don't think that, as a person who wears a funny hat full time, I don't think that there's a connection between wearing a funny hat and necessarily bad views. I think Ilhan Omar has bad views because she has bad views, and anti-Semitic views at that. Um, as far as the, as far as the generalized question as to free speech, this is one of the worst aspects of modern American politics, is what's happening where people dig up something that somebody said 10 years ago, and then they hit Tucker Carlson with something he said on Bubba the Love Sponge in 2007, and then we all pretend that we're saving the world because we've uncovered audio of, of Tucker making raunchy jokes on a stupid shock jock morning show a dozen years ago. And it's all nonsense, it's badly motivated nonsense. The only way that that's gonna be cured, honestly, is for advertisers to start understanding that these boycotts are sheer crap, they don't work, None of these advertisers lose money. I'm, I'm old enough to remember when they tried to boycott Chick-fil-A. It was a giant fail. If advertisers had the stones to actually stand by people instead of running for the hills, and they don't even have to agree with those people. They can simply say, we advertise on a wide range of products. We don't necessarily agree with those products, but we're happy to contribute to the debate. That's something that's going to have to happen. You know, I actually ran an organization for a couple of years that was specifically designed to be the anti-media matters. It was called Truth Revolt. And I, we explicitly said, we don't like this tactic that we are using, but we are going to use this tactic until the left learns that we can use it against you too. We knocked Martin Bashir off the air. We knocked Alec Baldwin off the air. It's really not difficult. You can pretty much knock anybody off the air with about 50 phone calls to customer service. It's really not tough. But until advertisers start to understand that, it's gonna continue to, to be a problem. And until we start recognizing that virtually all of this stuff is motivated by sheer desire to knock people off the air. It's not about people who are truly offended by Tucker Carlson, for example. It's about people who hate Tucker Carlson and are now using some piece of garbage that they found 10 years ago as an excuse to go after Tucker Carlson. That has nothing to do with making our politics better and everything to do with making our politics worse. Hello. Um, so as a young person that lives in Los Angeles, I don't honestly know how you've done it for so long, but <laughs> without moving and without, like, outside of church, synagogue, what have you, how would you recommend finding young conservative men? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a real question. It's a concern. 
we'll have to start. We'll have to start Rinder, Reagan, Tinder. Uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, we'll have to. There has to be a conservative dating service. I mean, the the reality is that I believe that that most conservatives probably are still meeting each other through church or through family. I met my beautiful wife through my sister, uh, and uh, that's because they met at a Jewish event at, at UCLA. Uh, I, I still do believe that if you want to spend your life with someone who shares your values, then church is probably the place to start. That doesn't mean that, and if you can't find somebody in, in the church you're going to, maybe you should try another church. Uh, it's, I, I say this about dating very often. The only purpose of dating is for marriage. Uh, I know this is an unpopular view in, in modern life, but, um, and I know that you don't disagree with that. So. Host Singles Night. Yeah, exactly. Shapiro Singles Night would definitely be awkward. <laughs> it would be very intense. It would be like speed dating. Give me all the facts about you now. No feelings, only facts. <laughs> um, hello. Howdy. I wanted to ask you... You heard the owl, everybody's, everybody thinks you're cute, so... <laughs> If you were to run for president in, say, 2024, what would your main campaign promise be? Uh, well, if I were the president, let's put it that way, if I, if I were the president, uh, my, and this would be my main campaign promise also, it would be to slash the executive branch so far that it would be minuscule. The executive branch, because there, so I would have, a, I would have a, a dual goal. If I ran for president, I would have a dual goal. Goal one would be to use the massive platform that comes from running for president simply to educate. That's where I think President Reagan was far and above beyond anybody else. It's where I think that President Trump really lacks. I think President Trump has done a lot of good conservative things that I like, but he's very bad at educating the American public about why those things are correct or why the philosophy of Western civilization has to be upheld because I don't think he thinks about those things, frankly. I mean, Shark Week's on. But with that said, uh, I think that, you know, the, I think that, you know, the, the, two, the two things that I would seek to do, if you're the president, there's only a couple of things that you can do other than what President Trump has already done, right? I mean, appointing good judges is one of those things. Working to cut taxes is one of those things. But the president really fundamentally has two jobs. One, protect the country, which I believe is nearly the only proper function of the, of the federal executive branch uh, to enforce the laws and protect the country. And two, is to educate the American populace using the bully pulpit at your disposal. That would be, that'd be my goal. And honestly, I really liked Rick Perry's promise back in 2012. He said that his goal was to make Washington insignificant in your life. That sounds fantastic to me. Um, hi, Ben. Uh, thank you so much for holding this event for us. Um, I am an elementary school teacher. And uh, I've seen what's been happening over the years. And as having a son in the military, it's a little disheartening to me that a lot of public school teachers don't even say the Pledge of Allegiance anymore in the morning. Um, and in public school, we've always put up the current president in our classroom. What would you have me say to someone, because I have President Trump up in my classroom, and I am in a um, school that has a, a populace of minorities, that a lot of people will say to me, how can you put that poster up? It's, it's disrespectful of our students, and it might be insulting to them. I mean, I think the first thing that you would say is you're putting it up because President Trump is the occupant of the Oval Office. That doesn't mean an endorsement of, of him or anything he says any more than it would mean endorsement of Obama. If you want to defend Trump, that's a different thing. But the reality is that putting up a picture of the President of the United States, as you have historically done, what would change that is saying that Trump somehow is not the President or something. And that, that seems obviously silly to me. And my rule about President Trump, by the way, as far as defending him, is when he says things that I don't agree with and that I don't like, I don't defend him, and I think they're dumb. And when he says stuff that I like, then I defend him, because he's a human. Right? This is what I do with all humans. I do with my own children. Uh, as far, number one, before I go any further, thank you, for, thank your son for, for what he does for the country. And thank you for being the kind of mother who's made that happen. Again, I think that the public schools are a generalized disaster area. That's not true for every public school. I think that the, the public schools have been manipulated. They've used as, been used as a political tool, particularly by state government in conjunction with teachers' unions. They have an agenda. That agenda has a, a, a monetary component to it. Uh, folks have called it the civil rights question of our time, and I think that that's absolutely true. Being able to choose which public school your kid goes to, being able to control locally what sort of material your kids are learning, and being able to interact with the best teachers and making sure the best teachers are in the toughest jobs 
honestly, that we pay teachers what they should be paid based on their performance and based on the difficulty of their job. That seems to me a much better solution than what the left has decided, which is that we will grant seniority privileges so that you go to an easier job for more pay over the course of your career. It's idiotic. Hello, Supreme Leader Shapiro. Um, <laughs> Why do you think uh, the left has increased uh, its attacks on Israel and its support for anti-Semitism recently? So I gave a speech at the University of Pittsburgh where I went through the three sources of anti-Semitism in the modern world. There is right-wing extremist white supremacy in the largely in Europe, it also exists in the United States, the alt-right. Uh, that's one form of anti-Semitism, and that form of anti-Semitism basically says that the Jews are a nefarious cancer, and the Jews are in control of all the money, and all the usual kind of anti-Semitic tropes. Then there is the, the scourge of Islamic anti-Semitism, which obviously uh, reigns supreme in large swaths of the Islamic world, and that is simple religious discrimination combined in some areas with a sort of racial discrimination uh, that could be found in the pages of Der Sturmer. This is true in Palestinian newspapers, for example. Uh, and finally, there's left-wing anti-Semitism. Left-wing anti-Semitism is basically driven by the same force that drives intersectionality. So it's really funny. The left, which considers itself so intersectional, we love all minorities, except the Jews. Right? Also, maybe the Asians. So the, 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 the left, which does this routine, the reason, that they, the, the reason they do this routine is because for the left, their fundamental principle upon which they base their entire worldview is that if there are two people in a room and one person has $5 and one person has $1, that's because the person with $5 stole his money from the person with $1. That means that if there is a group that is disproportionately well-educated and successful, it must be because that group exploited somebody. So when the left looks at Israel and they say, okay, here's Israel, which has only existed for since 1948, Here's Israel, which is wildly more successful than any of its neighbors, far wealthier, far more militarily powerful. It must be because of exploitation. It must be because they did something wrong. And the more victimized you are, the more you are a victim in the left narrative of the world. So they look at Israel, Israel is successful, that means Israel is very bad. They look at Jews, and Jews are very successful, that means Jews can't be victims, Jews must be part of the superstructure of victimizers. And you see this in, in how Ilhan Omar talks about Jews. Right? The Jews are in control, the Jews, Jews can't be seen as a victimized group, even though Jews are, by percentage, the most victimized group in terms of hate crimes across the United States on a per capita basis, and it's not particularly close. Still, Jews can't be victims because Jews are disproportionately wealthy and well-educated and all the rest of this, so we sort of ignore that. The New York Times admitted as much, by the way. The New York Times in October had an entire article on the vast spate of hate crimes against Jews that have been springing up in Brooklyn, for example. And they said, why haven't we covered this before? Because there's been this massive year-on-year -year increase every single year. And they say in the article, I mean, it was a stunning admission. They say in the article, we didn't cover this because it doesn't match our narrative. It doesn't match our narrative. Our narrative is that the only real anti-Semitism is from a higher ranking intersectional group, meaning anti-Semitism can be from white supremacists to Jews, but it can never be from black folks to Jews, or from Hispanic folks to Jews, or from Muslims to Jews, because that violates the intersectional pyramid. Well, it's my view that anti-Semitism from any corner is absolutely wrong, but intersectionality is in and of itself a deeply evil philosophy. The basis of intersectionality which is that we actually, that the people have variant experiences because of their membership in groups. There's some truth to that, but once you start ranking groups and their viewpoints based on their, their perceived victimization, instead of looking at them as individual people, then you are falling into exactly the sort of tribalism that destroys civilizations. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm really concerned about propaganda in this country, it seems that 90% of our media now, uh, yeah, there's freedom of speech, but there's also lies by omission. Um, and, and I understand when President Trump does say fake news is the enemy of the people, not the reporters, but not telling the entire truth. Um, my family's been broken up over this um, because they're brainwashed. They hear the same words over and over again, con man, racist, this and that, and even us as supporters of the president are called racist. At what point can the media be held accountable for what they're doing because it's wrong? I mean, the media should be held accountable for failing to do their jobs and doing what they think their real jobs are, which is their opinion journalists the same way that I am. No. You know, I want to be fair here. My quibble with President Trump's talk about fake news is if President Trump restricted his talk about fake news to stuff that was actually fake, when, when the media tell a lie about him, when they make up a story, 
or when the media simply shade a narrative to achieve a particular end. If you said that stuff is fake news, I would totally agree with it. My problem with President Trump is that fake news to President Trump sometimes means stuff I don't like. And so it'll be like, oh, there's a story about my inauguration crowd size. That's fake news. Fake news. And it's like, well, no, it really wasn't so much. So if he could restrict his criticism of the media to areas where it's appropriate, then I would be on his side completely. Uh, I'm extraordinarily critical of the media. I mean, I'm the guy who went on CNN in 2014 and said if, if Hamas could create a news network, it would look kind of like you guys. <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm, I'm exorbitantly critical of the media. The media commit two types of sin. Right? They, they commit sins by commission and sins by omission. So sins by commission are things like the Parkland shooting 15 minutes hate that was just given an award today by USC. The Walter Cronkite Award was given to CNN for that awful Parkland Town Hall where they brought Marco Rubio on stage and had people badger him and scream at him and had people scream at Dana Lash. They got an award for that. I mean, that's, that's a sin by commission. It's obvious that was a political agenda. And the award specifically said and thanked CNN for forwarding the debate, which is not their job, right? They were supposed to be into news coverage. So that's a sin by commission. And there are sins by omission where they just don't cover the good economic news, or as I say, they don't cover hate crimes in New York City, but they're going to cover Tree of Life. You know, the, the fact is that the media have enormous power. Now, the good news is that the diffusion of sources from which people see things has allowed us to see truths that we wouldn't otherwise have seen, right? I have a website, The Daily Wire, and Daily Wire gets 140 million page views a month. That's a very large number, right? My podcast is listened to, and well, it's downloaded a million times a day. If you put that in radio statistics, it's bigger than any radio show in the United States. I mean, it's, it's, they, we have means of distribution. That's why I think a lot of us are fearful that those means of distribution will eventually be shut down via Twitter, via Facebook, um, and, and that's dangerous. We're gonna have to build alternative methods of distribution. Is this going to be more polarizing? Yeah, of course it's gonna be more polarizing because the fact is that in an environment where we all get our news from different sources, you're not gonna be able even to agree on a simple set of facts with people in your own family. If you read Huffington Post and then you read Breitbart, it's two completely separate narratives. And this predates President Trump. This is not unique to President Trump. This has been going on for legitimately years. I remember before the 2012 election, my mom turned to me and she said, is Romney gonna win? Because I read Breitbart and I keep saying he's gonna win. And then I read Huffington Post, where I look at their front page and they say that he's gonna lose. And I have no idea which is true. And I said, well, nobody knows which one is true. Right? But the fact is that as we polarize and as the media are exposed for what they are, the media are complaining about it because they say we don't have the kind of control we had. They shouldn't have that kind of control. They never deserved that kind of control. Hi, Ben, thanks for being here. So one of my favorite things about your show is Good Trump, Bad Trump, because you're intellectually honest and you oh, thank you. I put it right to him. Um, does Donald Trump call you for advice? And if not, how do we get him to? <laughs> so uh, I have never had a conversation with the president, uh, which is kind of the way I like it, uh, the, the, honestly, because the, the president, here's the thing about the president and advice. Not a thing. So the president is not good at taking advice like from his advisors, let alone from an outsider like me. You know, people he deeply trusts, he has trouble taking advice from. You know, one, of the, one of the reasons that you know, I'm not supremely interested in having a personal relationship with the president is because I get to say what I want, and the president basically does what he does, and that's good. Uh, I don't want to be in a position where the president demands absolute fealty. Uh, and then I'm expected to deliver that absolute fealty or he's angry at me. Like, why, why, why would I be interested in that? Now, do I speak with a lot of people in the administration? Yeah, I speak to a lot of people in the administration on a fairly regular basis. And it's their job to try and filter, you know, if I give good advice, try and filter that advice to the president. Sometimes that is effective, maybe. I mean, I don't know. I'm not really in the closed loop. Sometimes it is ineffective. But look, here's the reality about the president. Based on his policy and based on the economy, the guy should be at 55% approval rating. The fact is that if the president were not who, if the president could stop his face from moving and sounds from emerging, and if the president could stop the tweeting for five freaking seconds, he would gain points. And listen, I know, listen, I know, I enjoy it too, guys. Come on, it's funny, right? That, that, that bleep is funny, right? I get it, it's, it's hilarious. And those of us who are in his base, you know, we appreciate it. We're like, oh yeah, he's fighting back, that's great. Okay, how's he gonna win suburban women now? Like, really, this is my first question that I asked to everybody in the administration. Between 2000 and 2004, George W. Bush lost the popular vote in 2000, then he won 11 million additional votes by 2004. President Trump lost the popular vote by 2.5 million votes to Hillary Clinton. He won in the narrowest election of all time by 80,000 votes in three states. Where is he going to come up with an additional 14 million votes? It's not by tweeting. That's not where he's going to come up with the additional 14 million votes. He's going to have to convince some people that he is not only a, a good policy guy, 
but also a worthy occupant of the Oval Office. And maybe silence is the best solution to that. Now, maybe the Democrats do them a favor and nominate somebody crazy. I would say odds are that that's pretty good, right? I mean, they, <laughs> look at that field. I mean, when the most reasonable person is beta, then I don't know what to say about that field. Now, when you're taking seriously the geriatric socialist, who legitimately was thrown off a commune in the 1970s for being too useless, and that guy is your thought leader, <laughs> then, yeah, I, then I get, let's just say this, for whatever reason, God loves Trump, right? I mean, there's no question. He's the luckiest man in the history of the world. <laughs> Whether that luck runs out in 2020, he, let's put it this way, he can make his odds better if he would stop with, with sort of the inane media-generating hits. And go, look at, people don't believe me, look at 2018. In the 2018 election, during the Kavanaugh hearings, Democrats lost their entire lead in every poll. And then President Trump decided he wanted to be the center of attention, and Republicans got blown out across the country. 8.6% was the final margin of victory in the House popular vote. And that's not great, and we don't want to see that replicated. So, Mr. President, keep doing good things. Go watch Shark Week. <laughs> We've got time for just uh, two more quick questions. We'll go here and then here. Okay. Hi, Mr. Shapiro. Um, I'm a really big fan. I've actually been trying to get an internship with you, so maybe like <laughs> work that out. Um, but my question is, you know, I'm a high school student, and so for my generation, I was wondering, what are you thinking America is going to look like in about 20 years? You know, I, what is America going to look like in 20 years? I mean, I think. This is kind of a cop-out, but a lot depends on, obviously, what we do now and what we educate kids into now. Uh, and that means that the reason I really, one of the reasons I wrote the book is because if I want young people to engage with conservative ideas, they need to engage with conservative ideas. They need to engage in the battle of ideas. They need to understand where we're coming from. Too much of politics is done at surface level. Too much of politics is done at the tip of the iceberg where we fight over whatever Trump tweeted today. And that's not convincing young people. You know, look, I didn't vote for President Trump in 2016. I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton either. I'm more likely to vote for President Trump in 2020. But one of my chief concerns with President Trump in 2016 is that he was going to poison young people toward conservatism and toward the Republican Party. And if you look at polls, that has not been an idle concern. I mean, I just want to be absolutely factual about this. The polls are not good for President Trump among people who are under the age of 40. And those people are not shifting the way that the sort of conventional wisdom says that they should, that over time they become more conservative. The statistics are not showing that, which means that we have a lot of work to do if we want to teach people about conservative principles. If that doesn't happen, then we are going to see a continued movement in favor of bigger government, in favor of AOC-type radicalism. We're going to see more of the let's embrace big government programs, more of the attempts to shut down free speech in the name of preventing hate speech. It could get very ugly over the next 20 years. I think that the state is going to be a good bellwether for how bad things can be. I mean, frankly, listen, I've lived in California my entire life. I am scared where this state is going. As a religious American, I am deeply afraid that this state is going to immediately start cracking down on churches and synagogues <laughs> on the basis of supposed anti-discrimination, and then they will come after me, and they'll come after my kids. So is that the direction that the country can move? Absolutely, but it doesn't have to move that way. But again, that means that we have to actively make the case for why our principles are good. And if people want to talk about Trump, honestly, I think that I've said this all along. One of the things I think that has made my show popular and that makes my writing popular and my speaking is I don't tend to talk about President Trump very much. I don't think that whoever occupies the Oval Office is deeply important other than the ideas they espouse. The battle of ideas is where this thing is going to be won or lost over the next 20 years. And if we don't win it, it will be lost and there's nobody else left to back us up. Last question over here. All right, so this is kind of two questions, I guess. So the first question is, as much as it's joked about, why don't you run for president? You know, you, you have the support, and I would argue that you're definitely smarter than most politicians out there. Well, that's not a high compliment, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, um, when can we expect the next meme review? <laughs> <laughs> Well, for folks who are above the age of 30, meme review is a thing that there's this guy on, P on YouTube. He's the most followed YouTuber. Uh, and his name is PewDiePie. And uh, PewDiePie apparently watches some of my videos, and he asked me to do something called meme review. And so we did, a, uh, so we did one of his YouTube videos, and it is popular with the younger set. So that's what that is for folks who just have no idea what the hell is being talked about. Um, as, as far as running for president, honestly, the real, the real consideration is um, th there are a few different considerations. One, my wife is in the room, so I can't say yes, uh, or she will murder me. Like, legitimately, I will not make it home. My wife desperately does not want me to run for office, and I can't blame her because 
legitimately being in the public eye is deeply uncomfortable. Like, I, uh, listen, I'm, de I'm flattered. I love the fact that people take seriously ideas that I think matter. That's why I do what I do every day. But being campaigning sounds terrible. Being away from my kids sounds terrible. Now, all this stuff sounds terrible. It's a tremendous sacrifice. Honestly, I know a lot of politicians, and as much as I make fun of them, they are making a big sacrifice when they spend all of their time on the road campaigning and away from their families. That's a difficult lifestyle for sure. Um, also, the question is, could I do more good in public office than I'm doing right now speaking to legitimately millions of people? And I have an enormous audience, thank God, uh, and I get to educate them without having to worry about pandering politically to anybody. Uh, if, if I did end up running for office, it might more be as an object lesson in what it looks like to be honest while running for office than an exercise in actual victory. Because the truth is that people who tend to win have to shade messages, and they don't get to tell the truth all the time, and they have to win over certain people. Uh, and you know, I, I would see how far you could push that, but I'd have to be convinced that one of a couple of things were true. One, either the benefit of running outweighs the, outweighs the downside of not being able to do what I do, or two, that the situation were so grim and I didn't see any other prospects on the horizon that I would legitimately be almost forced into it. That's, that's the only reason I would ever run for public office. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. It means the world to me. Thank you. Thank you.